Hello everybody, welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Um, today about 20% of women begin their pregnancy with a BMI of 30 or greater. And studies have shown that maternal obesity influences several aspects of infant and childhood health, including weight status and neurodevelopment. According to a new report issued by Early Nutrition, a project involving 36 international research organizations, obesity during pregnancy and during a child's early life triples a child's risk of becoming obese. For children of parents who are overweight but not obese, they have a risk that's twice as high. The Early Nutrition Project has set up a website to educate the public about its findings and to make recommendations. They include that pregnant women should not eat as if for two people, that babies should not receive any cow's milk at all during the first year of life. I would add to that during any part of life, but at least this is a step in the right direction. Breastfeeding mothers must eat well and both parents should eat well prior to conception. People with a BMI of 25 or higher are considered overweight and both fathers and mothers should lose weight before conception according to the group. Both parents have an equal effect on the obesity risk of their children, interestingly enough. But increased risk of obesity isn't the only risk factor. Maternal and paternal obesity are also associated with developmental delays too. Data for over 3,700 single birth children and over 1,000 twins and their parents was analyzed to look at this specific issue. And what happened was the parents were asked to complete ages and stages questionnaires for their kids at several intervals starting at four months and ending at 36 months of age. This is a pretty good tool for evaluating things like fine motor, gross motor, communication, personal social functioning, and problem solving skills. Well, the researchers reported that children of obese mothers had an increased risk of failing the fine motor domain. The risk of reduced personal social function was increased if fathers were obese, and having two obese parents increased the likelihood of failing multiple domains, including fine motor, personal social, and problem solving. There was no difference between the boys and the girls. They had equally bad outcomes with obese parents. The negative effect um, was the same for both. This was the first study that looked at the effect of both maternal and paternal obesity on early childhood development, but I was actually to find, uh, able to find other studies that had looked at the issue of paternal influence, and I think we don't talk about that enough. We're always, uh, obviously, maternal, if maternal influence has a huge uh, you know, bearing on what happens with children, but I think often the paternal, the father's influence is underestimated and not talked about enough. Additionally, other studies have shown that neurologically related disorders, particularly related to moms, and these include attention um, hyperactivity disorder, autism spectrum disorders, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, a variety of eating disorders, and impairments on cognition for children who are born to obese moms. Now there are several mechanisms of action, which include exposure to inflammation during prenatal brain development, hyperglycemia, micronutrient deficiency, and altered development of the serotonin system. When we talk about inflammation, obesity does increase inflammation levels in general in the body. As fat cells grow larger as they store fatty acids, a compensatory mechanism is set in force where those cells start producing inflammatory cytokines, which um, is to restrict those fat cells from getting any bigger, but contributes to generalized uh, inflammation throughout the body. Well, the implications of these studies are pretty significant, and I could read studies like this to you till next week's video clips on Tuesday. That's how many there are and how important this issue of maternal and paternal health are for the health of the child. Um, the reason it's so important is because most people in our country right now are overweight or obese. I mean, most American kids have at least one obese parent. Many of them have two. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to start having this very difficult discussion, including doctors with their patients, about the importance of weight loss and health improvement, preferably before conception. Um, you know, about half the pregnancies in, in the United States, at least, and I think it's probably true for a lot of Westernized countries, are unplanned. So, of course, we're all familiar with the phenomenon of a person, woman finds out she's pregnant and immediately becomes interested in, in doing all the right healthy things. And I think we need to back that process up to, you know, if you're of reproductive age, really any age, but for purposes of this discussion, reproductive age, you should be really paying attention to your health for a variety of reasons, including the fact that you might end up pregnant. You certainly want to give your baby the best chance in life.
Now, the next thing I want to talk about is vitamin D in plants. I was so excited to, actually I've known about this for a while, I finally had some time a week ago to sit down and do some research and, and uh, finally be able to report about this to you. So let's just start by saying humans are designed to produce vitamin D in response to sunlight, which is why few food sources contain it. I mean, it's been misclassified as a vitamin. Vitamins, by definition, are substances that humans can't synthesize, and they therefore must be eaten in food. And so you can see what the problem is. If we're designed to produce it ourselves in response to sunlight, it's really not a vitamin. So that's where the misunderstanding comes from. Well, vitamin D um, uh, is stored for use when sunlight's not available. A lot of people are insisting that at least in the winter months, if you live in a northern climate like I do here in Ohio, you should be supplementing with vitamin D. There are a lot of articles posted in the Health Briefs Library that deal with that issue, and I don't want to regurgitate it all here. I just want to say that let's talk about sources of vitamin D. For most people, it's supplements and uh, fortified foods. And then there is some vitamin D in animal foods, with fish being a particularly concentrated source. Salmon contains 30 international units per 100 grams, tuna almost that much. And then other animal sources include eggs, meat, and milk. Now the vitamin D content that naturally occurs in animal foods, it's highly variable depending upon what the animal has been fed. So there are some people who say, uh, believe it or not, maybe you shouldn't eat so many animal foods because that's not the best source of vitamin D, you're better off getting it from a supplement. I would argue the supplement's probably safer than all the animal foods, but I'm back to sunlight. That's the best way to produce vitamin D. Well, let's get to the part that has to do with plants. Research shows that both vitamin D2 and D3 are available in plants, produced by things like fungi and yeast through exposure to sunlight. Both wild mushrooms like chanterelles and cultivated mushrooms are significant sources of vitamin D2. In 1924, researchers discovered that when foods like linseed oil, cottonseed oil, wheat, and lettuce were exposed to light from a mercury lamp, they could be used to cure rickets. Thinking began to shift when it was discovered that grazing animals sometimes developed calcium intoxication, similar to that which would be expected from vitamin D toxicity, and it would result from eating certain types of plants. So eventually it was discovered that plants not only can contain vitamin D2, but that they contain vitamin D3. Sterols are precursors to many steroid hormones, including vitamin D, and they are abundant in plants, and that explains why some plants are able to synthesize vitamin D. It's through the interaction of the plant sterols with, vitamin, with the sunlight that you end up with vitamin D production. Vitamin D3 has been found in the leaves of several parts, uh, plants that are part of the uh, nightshade family, um, and in the leaves and fruit of certain subclasses of nightshade vegetables. Uh, it's also been found in alfalfa and ryegrass. Um, and the amount of vitamin D that's in food, it's also very similar to animals in that it's unpredictable. It depends upon the amount of sunlight, the maturity of the plant at the time that the plant is harvested for, for food. Now, interestingly enough, I mentioned before that fish have concentrated amounts of vitamin D, but the origin is actually from plants, microalgae, which the fish eat for food. So even fish that are a source of vitamin D, they're getting it from plant-based foods. Now, I'm going to come back to the best way to ensure adequate vitamin D levels. Get your body out in the sun. If you're fortunate enough to live in a climate where you can get the sun every day, that's great. In Ohio, we have to get all of our sun between May and about early October because then it gets too cold and gray around here. Your body will store it for winter. But the good news for people who are interested in optimal health is that um, in addition to doing that, you can take in some vitamin D from plants because a lot of us don't want to consume animal foods and junk foods and vitamins and supplements and things of that nature. This will also be good for the oceans and the fish populations, which are becoming increasingly overexploited. I mean, we just really have to stop polluting the oceans with fish farms and overfishing fish, vitamin D or not. And since it's been proven that plants can th synthesize vitamin D with sun exposure, maybe at some point in time we can look forward to um, an industry that will develop about around cultivating plants specifically for their vitamin D exposure. That would be kind of fun to look forward to. All right, well, that's all for today and all for the week. So pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you on Tuesday with more news.